You probably forgot that I left you with some homework last time. I have completely. I can't remember <laughs> you last time. I, th I thought I asked you to give some thought to uh, if there's anything you wanted to say beyond what we've already talked about. This will probably be our last session. And uh, if there's any comments you wanted to make that are things that you thought of since then or... I'm afraid not, Roy. I hadn't thought about it. I okay. I run over anything, but I don't, don't think of anything. Okay. Probably couldn't if I spent time on it. That's fine. As things come, you know, we were talking before about how the mind's a relative, relativity device that it can only remember things that it's led to. Yeah. It can't just grab something out of thin air and remember it. So uh, it's not built that way. So maybe as things come up, you'll. You've been very good about adding in comments. So, well, let's just continue where we left off. Then we were talking about some of the planes that you've owned, and what what will happen is even though they're showing here, is that I will actually put these that picture on the screen. You're over to the right a little bit and I'll fill into the left of you with that picture. So that's how it'll work. But uh, what's the story on this one? Well, that's a, a call there. That they, I understand, who, who was it? Was it you? No, it was, told me on the phone, they've got a call there out at the museum now. Yeah, it was actually out last sec second Saturday. But it is whoever it was said that it was it got an automobile engine in. Well, I thought maybe it had, but maybe it doesn't. I was, I was real busy. I, there was somebody who showed up, and there was a Swiss glider, really old, nineteen, thirties or forties Swiss glider that the guy brought, and I took pictures of that to bring over and show you, and I forgot them. Um, and I'll take pictures of the call there too, but. I want to I want to get you over there and run through the museum again because you'd probably like to see that call air and I bet you'd really be interested in this new glider that's there. Is it an open frame glider? No, it's got a bubble canopy on it, which I don't I don't see how it's got a bubble canopy and have it made in the vintage they said it was because I didn't think they made bubble canopies back then, but I don't believe they did. But it's a it's a kind of a big gall winning thing and no, it's, it's real pretty. I got pictures of Minimo in my pictures. Yeah, and it's Swiss that's markings on the tail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a Minimo. That's yeah. at at one time that was considered the class, the class glider. Yeah, it was such a uh, aesthetically beautiful thing with that. It is. It's around. very beautiful. Uh -huh. But it has a uh, molded uh, bulbous canopy on it. Well, the one we had. My friend John and I had in Georgia didn't have a, bu a bubble canopy at all. Yeah. So it's just gliders are much more than airplanes, prone to be modified yeah. over time. I think the one, uh, I've got those pictures of the one you were flying and it's open cockpit, isn't it? Well, one of them was. Yeah. So did you were, were you part owner in this airplane then? Yes. This was basically uh, bought by my friend Wallace and <clears throat> had quite a story and obtained. He'd been looking for one a long time because it was, he and I both thought it was pretty much the same airplane as my our Kenner that we had, that, that uh, Kenner airplane that I had and he had with, he owned with me that too. <clears throat> and so he was looking for one and I, I knew it a little bit but wasn't paying much attention to it after quite a few years why all of a sudden he came up with this for sale in Texas and said he had to go out we had to go out there and look at it. So we got our other other friend Josh Powell that had the had the twin uh, travel there, beach, twin beach and talked Josh into taking us out there. And uh, so one day, I don't remember when, I guess it was probably a Saturday weekend, we the three of us headed off for Texas and it was pretty good in Georgia, but it was pretty cloudy in Texas and Josh was very reluctant to push into the bad weather but it was kind of spread and cumulus built up and there were a lot of holes in between and but it was getting darker and we kept pushing in there and pushing in there and I kept telling Josh go this way and that and finally got to <clears throat> where we thought the field was started looking around and sure enough saw the runway right down south that was a couple of miles and headed for it and straight in and just just as we, I mean, it must have been instantaneous as we landed 
we thought the landing had been terrible or something. We felt this big jolt and there was a flash and the lightning had struck a, a building on the side of the runway down a little ways ahead of us and just exploded it. Wow. And we were rolled out right past it. <laughs> Josh and Wallace both just about jumped out of the airplane, <laughs> but it didn't hurt us at all. But that was a good good beginning for the call area. We taxed on in and found the airplane in a hangar there with a bunch of old guys that were around it there, lived there. And we talked to them a little while. I flew it around the field to see if it was all right. We walked around it a lot, looked at it, looked good. They said it was just good shape. So I flew it around the field and it seemed to be fine. So I always wrote them a check for it. And uh, so. Wallace and Josh got back in the twin and headed for Georgia, and I got the call there and headed for Georgia. And I got to Mississippi that night and stayed in Mississippi and uh, got to Georgia the next day. And then Wallace took it over to fly it. But Wallace was a great big guy, as you may yeah. you probably don't remember all the mm -hmm. times I've talked about him. But he, he, had, he had tried sitting in, 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 in Texas, but he seemed to be all right when we got to Georgia and he really got serious about sitting and he found it was really crap for him. So he had to get his wife to remake the the cushions and he remade the seat mount and got the seat moved back, moved back a little bit so he could get his feet on. He was flying with his feet way up like this on the rudder pedals uh -huh. at first and he finally got it straight down and then it, it had, I might have to think a minute, Yeah, this is the cow. This is the way we got it with a cow like this. But after we flew it a little bit, found out there was uh, when the weather was warm, it was getting real hot, and so it needed more air exhaust area. And we ended up making a whole new cow and putting a great big, just open hole on this side right there, great big hole, and flew it that way. The rest of the time we had it, and when Johnny Dunn and I delivered it to the guy that we sold it to in, in uh, uh, what's next to Idaho? Idaho, Wyoming's on the other Wyoming. side. Wyoming. Afton, Wyoming. It's where the Call Air Museum is. Mm -hmm. And he, the guy that, he already had a Call Air just like this and it was in the museum and uh, he, he wanted to buy this one from Wallace. So, he did, uh, and I delivered it out there, Johnny and I. Let's see here. And, uh, oh, on the way, we stopped at one place in Kansas, Gooding, I believe, Gooding, Kansas, and stopped on a real hot day in the summer, about 105 on the ground, and when it took off, that thing was, the uh, temperature just came right up, more right to the red line. And uh, so I had just had, couldn't even care of climb power. Finally, had to throttle back and slow down that temperature. And so we, we got up about a couple thousand feet and, and we just floated around there and I decided what to do. I just circled around and there were some cues around. So I looked for some and found one that looked pretty good and circled on it and got some lift and got that thermal all the way up to 8,000 and, and without any more power. And then by then it was cool and put on the power and we took off then. <laughs> so other than that uh, momentary occasion, Johnny flew all the way, he was in the left seat, all the way from Georgia to Wyoming. Now, you, I apologize if you already said this because I was kind of distracted by setting up the camera here, but um, what was the power plant in this one? Let me think a minute, be sure I get it right. I heard it thought of so many. It was, a, I remember the original call areas were 125 Continentals, but this one had 150 Lycoming in it. Okay. Which is better power for it, but it was, and the call air was basically a three, it was designed and advertised as a three place, wide, one wide bench seat. Okay. Three seat belts across it. No back seat, just a wide bench seat. Oh, just a wide front seat. Yeah, wide seat. So it was okay width-wise for a large man then, huh? <laughs> yeah, width-wise, plenty. And a lot of room in it. It looks like it's from that picture, it's got four seats, but 
I guess he had a good no, cargo area back there. No, it was just a shelf there, a baggage yeah. compartment and a shelf on it you could open up right behind the back of the seat. So what were the flying characteristics or good pros and cons of this airplane? Well, it's just like a Kenner. It's a, it's a, it's a big, thick wing and a lot of struts for drag and good, no, no reason to design for anything other than pleasant flying characteristics. So the control characteristics are all were fine, and when you cut power, it, it really came down. It was not a glider. It had no float built into it. You'd think it wasn't, didn't have any lift in it when you cut the power. Down it went. So that made it really a, a good, accurate landing airplane, and it's pleasant to fly as long as the power was running. So all together, it's a really, really nice flying airplane. The, the somewhat limitation of it was the cabin. The Kenner was open cockpit. And this they enclosed, and the, the visibility of the struts on the front of the windshield were pretty wide, inch too wide, and kind of restricted visibility, and the windows on the side were pretty small. So it was somewhat limited visibility. You had to look around, be very conscious of looking around and seeing where what was around you. But other than that, it wasn't any problem. It, it flew and handled fine. It was a stick airplane, not a wheel. It had one great big long stick. In the, in the left side. Oh, so it could only be flown on the left side, huh? Yeah, it had a stick socket on the right, but no stick, the one we had. Mm -hmm. And we had rudder pedals, but no stick. You could take the stick out of the left and put it on the right. I guess they designed it that way to take care of people who preferred to fly on the right for some reason. Huh. Some previous airplanes was that way and they wanted the same. Okay. So they made it interchangeable. All right. It had exactly the same wing shape and the wing arrangement and the strut arrangement, all the struts, all the struts there, all the struts, exactly the same as the Kenner. And Wallace and I both had always thought that the call air was a, simply a copy of the Kenner. Mm -hmm. Changed maybe a little bit to make it look different and close the cockpit. But in, in the researching war, found out no, Mr. Call air Designed it completely himself. Didn't even know about the Kenner when he designed it. So, yeah, it's an original airplane. It was remarkable how how similar it was. The Kenner was looked the same except for open cockpit and a blunt firewall and a, yeah. and a big radial engine. Otherwise, it looks just the same. Was did was one in, did one influence the other? Well, Were they just? Were they designed uh, independently, or did one yeah. influence the other? Yeah, that's what I was saying, that, that Mr. Collair, we thought he'd copied, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. His story talked about how he thought about it and drew up a little bit of the time and yeah. designed it and built it. But, and Bert Kenner had done the Kenner airplane about eight years sooner, uh -huh. and they were basically all gone by then. They weren't popular at all. Okay. And so Mr. Collin didn't know anything about the Kenner. So he just came up with the same thing somehow. Kind of quite a coincidence somehow. Yeah. Well, let's go on to the next one then. Just hit that right well, here. One other difference okay. that Mr. Collier did this, this straight fin rudder is pretty much the same aerodynamically, you might say, uh, height and cord, but the Kenner had a, a much more curved line that came in and curved up and around and around this. The back was the same, but the front had this indented curve here. Wasn't was the Kenner longer. longer too? Huh? Didn't the Kenner have a longer fuselage? Mm, I can't really say that. It, it seems like long. it had more turtle back than that, but maybe well, not. Well, it seems longer, yeah. But it's, it's it might just be the, the uh, illusion of the covered can uh, Yeah, and the, and the cockpit was small. About When you look at the Kenner, the yeah. cockpit, the headrest, and windshield are very short. Yeah, it may have looked longer than uh, it might have changed the appearance. So I, without a tape measure, I wouldn't say it was longer or not, but it okay. looked longer. Okay, let's if that's if you got more to say, fine. Otherwise, we can go no, to the next that's one. Good. Okay, that's a says no one seventy rag wing that I bought in Georgia. I can't remember the year at all, but what I remember about it was that it was down south of Atlanta for sale, and Gene and I drove down there and looked at it and, and uh, decided to buy it, and then went back home, and I guess a day or two later, 
got a ride down there, and an airplane carried us down there. Forgot who carried us down there. Johnny, I believe, Johnny carried us in something. And uh, Gene flew with me when I came home with that airplane. That makes two like that. That, that one and the, the original, the earliest Kenner was the only two that, that she was with me when I flew them home. Mm -hmm. And that was a real good airplane. What What's the difference between that and a 175? Well, Jeremy's got a 175. A, a linear descendant, you might say. Yeah. But the first airplane in this line was the 170A Ragwing, which is that, what that is. Okay. Which is all metal, and as you see the tail and fuselage and, and, and tri gear, I mean. Uh, so it was kind of a grow, outgrowth of the 140. A bigger 140. Yeah, it, the 170 itself is is a bigger a four place 140. That's okay. correct. Okay. And uh, Cessna didn't make any bones about that. Their design philosophy was to keep the same thing going so that people flew this would like it and go on to the mm -hmm. next one. Exactly what Boeing does too. Uh -huh. And I guess it's worked pretty good for Cessna. They've made a lot of airplanes. But anyhow, after this airplane came the 170 B, which was a. a all metal wing. This head wing had, was fat. That's why you call it a rag wing. It was a fabric covered wing and a straight uh, rectangular plan, plan shape. But uh, the 170B was all metal wing, same few sides of tail, and a, a tapered, a two, two step tapered wing, which you see on all the Cessnas after that, mm -hmm. 150s and everything. And uh, also the, the uh, B had the first Fowler flaps, which are much, much bigger and more effective flaps. This airplane was exactly like the 140, which said in the handbook of the 140 that it has flaps, but they're not effective for flaps. They're just for practice for the handle and making students go through trim, trim changes, putting flaps down. Mm -hmm. Very harmless thing. Yeah. And this airplane is the same way, so it didn't have effective flaps at all. But it, this airplane also being the first four place 170 Cessna 170 would cruise with at 135 miles an hour and as Cessna continued to build 170 B's and, and then on down to the tri-gear and uh, on to the to, to they started the 175 they got slower and slower slower every year they had uh -huh. fuselage got bigger and rounder and deeper and the, Put the tri gear on it and all these little things as they went along, and it got slower. And at one point, I don't remember what year model the, the 170 uh, was down to, I think 110 normal cruise. Well, you can no, push a 150 that hard. <laughs> I'm sorry, it wasn't 110, it's 110 knots, which would be about 125 or so miles okay, an hour. Okay. So it wasn't as slow as it sounded as one knots. But I remember that 110 being the advertised speed and uh, of course they were great airplanes and very nice to fly all the way but but this was always it was stuck in my mind as the best one because of the speed and so I had, had several airplanes up to now I got this got to this stage I decided I want to go back to the old airplane get a rag wing uh -huh. so I got that one that was a real good one so is the 175 tricycle gear then yes the 175 was all tricycle okay there were several versions. I can't remember the numbers. The 175. They had the 175 had problems at first because they used the first issue used a geared geared. I don't know exactly how you explain the gearing, but some kind of a geared gear arrangement, gear box that allowed the propeller to run at a certain RPM and the engine to run slower. Oh. And uh, so the the first owners insisted, although it said in the handbook, that you've got to run this engine at this RPM, which is a higher RPM. The RPM was coming off the engine, not off the prop. Exactly. In order to get the prop down to the right range, I had to run the engine higher. I think it was around 3200 or 3400, something like that. And uh, people just didn't like the, that number. Uh -huh. It didn't sound different. You didn't know the difference. But that number was in everybody. And so everybody flew the 175 would throttle way back and just lug it along, yeah. get it too slow. And as a result, in the first year or two, the engine failures were magnificent. They yeah. just coked up and choked up and quit. And so everybody hated the 175 for a couple of years there and then 
stuff, and I finally put out a little ads and started telling people and fussing about it. And some smart people, mechanics in the field, began to write about it and talk about it a little bit, and everybody finally realized that if you just run them like the book says, they yeah. lasted fine. Uh -huh. huh. So it became a pretty good airplane then. But then, in the meantime, the pressure was on to the people that had them and everything, and these people started changing engines to Lycomings, and uh, there are lots, probably more Lycoming powered 175s than, any, than Continentals these days, mm -hmm. and it's just a fine airplane. And 175 was kind of a, a mismatch between a 170 and a 180. Mm -hmm. It was a stronger, heavier, roomier, faster airplane mm -hmm. than a 170, but not quite up to 180. But it had a very strong, I think, if I remember right, exactly the same wing as the 180, which made it a lot stronger. But well, Jeremy's, Jeremy's offered to give me a ride in his, so I guess I'll find out about it. He's got a 175? Yeah. How about that? You don't know what engine he's got. I don't know. Well, that'll be a question. Oh, when, I, when I go, I'll, I'll ask him, does this have the gear or not? And then he'll think I know what I'm, I know something. <laughs> well, uh, I was going to say, he'll, he'll know the whole story. You can bet on that. Yeah. Okay. So, so this was en route to the 175 and then on up to the 180. The whole line of, of Cessnas, which gone up, up to the 205, 206 and 207 today, the big, big Cessnas. Mm -hmm. But they're all the same airplanes, basically, and all fly just about alike. The major pilot vent difference in all those airplanes is that when they got to the first, first 182, the, the uh, control pressures were changed, engineering wise changed, to, and travel or something, I don't know exactly all of it, but, but you had to, you just either had really heavy back pressure for landing or you had to use a trim. So basically at that time we started calling everybody all of a sudden as trim airplanes because the trick was just to slow down in the pattern and start trimming. Right away, don't wait till you're on the final. Start trimming, rolling back, get that trim back. And then they just landed just fine, but you, you sure had to use both hands and your feet to land them if you didn't roll the trim in. Now you're rolling the trim backwards, though. Rolling the trim backwards, well, toward nose up. Yeah, it's backwards. Interesting, because I remember, I seem to have a memory of whenever I'm flying on 150, whenever I put the fly